tear your soul apart. Hellraiser, as a series, kind of became a joke there for a while. There are 11 entries in the series, but after the first two, enjoyment of 3 and 4 notwithstanding, the series became a joke for a solid stretch of the 2000s. Many of the movies weren't designed to be Hellraiser properties at all, but Pinhead was shoehorned in like a second-rate slasher villain to make it work. Shall we begin? Sure, we had some fun actors and directors strewn about, but mostly, they fell flat. Even the 2022 reboot, which was a bit divisive, but overall received well, didn't quite have the same charm as the original film. The first movie was based on Clive Barker's novella, The Hellbound Heart, and in a first on this show, the author was also behind the writing and directing of the movie. Shed no tears as it's a waste of good suffering while we find out what the fuck happened to this adaptation. Hellraiser is a 1987 film written and directed by Clive Barker based on his own novella. He had previously written an original script for a movie called Transmutations, or Underworld, that was made in 1985, and an adaptation of his own work Rawhead Rex the next year, but ultimately he was unhappy with how both those turned out. Those movies were successful enough that Hellbound Heart was optioned and Barker was allowed to write and direct it himself. It was released in September and made $14 million off its $1.6 million budget. This would of course lead to all the previously mentioned sequels, but apart from being an executive producer on the first three sequels, Barker would have no involvement. The cast would include the screen debut of Ashley Lawrence, Doug Bradley in a career-defining role, Andrew Robinson, Sean Chapman, and Claire Higgins. Barker would go on to write and direct Nightbreed and Lord of Illusions based on his own works Cabal and The Last Illusion, as well as write the stories for the Candyman sequel Farewell to the Flesh and a few smaller projects here and there. Ashley Lawrence made her first film of Hellraiser, but has had a steady horror career with a couple Hellraiser sequels, the underseen Mikey, Lurking Fear, and the third Warlock film. She also did a couple of episodes of the new Creepshow revival and an episode of channel favorite Monsters. Come to Daddy. Andrew Robinson showed up in Pumpkinhead 2, Child's Play 3, Trancers 3, and loads of TV, including some directing gigs. Presto, you're a ball. Sean Chapman and Claire Higgins don't necessarily stand out like the rest of their co-stars do, but as Frank and Julia, they're great in their roles. Chapman would come back as Frank in Hellraiser 2, Higgins, who hated horror movies and walked out 10 minutes into the screening of Hellraiser, came back for the immediate sequel, as well as more recent fare like The Sandman and a 52 episode turn on The Worst Witch. Finally, we have Pinhead himself, Doug Bradley. Bradley actually was an old friend of Clive Barker and the two founded a theater group together in the 70s. His first three movies would all be Clive Barker adjacent projects with the first two Hellraiser movies and Nightbreed. Coming to Hellraiser, I had, I had worked in the theater with Clive Barker for uh, a decade before Hellraiser happened and we had always done a lot of masking work. We'd done a lot of Commedia dell'arte inspired work, uh, mime, and uh, I've, I've always as well been, been interested in masking. He would go on to play Pinhead for eight films, more if you count video games and shorts and became horror royalty with that role and his other varied appearances in the genre that helped make him famous. The book, or novella in this case, was written by Clive Barker and published as part of the Night Visions Anthology series before eventually getting a standalone release in 1991. It would eventually be known as the first installment of the Hellraiser series, with the second installment, The Scarlet Gospels, coming in 2015, and the third installment, Hellraiser the Toll, coming in 2018. While an early piece for Barker, it wasn't his first. His first outing in the world of publishing would be the Books of Blood story collection from 1984. Hellbound Heart was inspired by Barker's turn as a male prostitute in the 1970s. He wanted to, quote, tell a story about good and evil where sexuality was the connective tissue, and much of the look of the Cenobites was inspired by underground s and clubs he saw in New York and London. One of the early names of the film adaptation was even Sadomasochist from Hell. Although that and the joke title offered from a 60-year-old crew member of What a Woman Will Do for a Good Fuck were shot down in favor of Hellraiser. We already discussed the filmmaker side of Barker, but he's also a playwright, artist, and designer. He has novels such as The Damnation Game, novellas like, well, today's subject, and is working on a book of poetry. 
He's helped design action figures with his Tortured Souls series in the early 2000s, and his Infernal Parade line with famed toy creator Todd McFarlane a few years after. Barker has even been involved in some video games through the years. A PC-exclusive first-person shooter hybrid game called Clive Barker's Undying was released in 2001, with another original story called Jericho coming out in 2007. Even before that, we saw two different kinds of adaptations for his Nightbreed property. One game, Nightbreed the Interactive Movie, is a hybrid of point-and-click and exploration that came out for the Atari ST, DOS, and the Amiga. Nightbreed the Action Game was a more traditional side-scrolling actioner that came out for the three previously mentioned systems, as well as the Commodore 64, ZX Spectrum, and Amstrad CPC. There was supposed to be a third game, an RPG, but it never came to fruition. More relevant to today's story, and I'm still not sure if it's real or not, is an unreleased NES game on the Hellraiser property. That would have been a wild one. Barker's one hell of a creator, pun intended. He's intelligent, creative, and can seemingly do it all. Check out any number of the things he's put out into existence, although you may already have and not realized it, like Candyman being based on one of his short stories. Quite a lot is the same from page to screen, and I'm sure that's in no small part to the original author being the writer and the director. Sure, they don't always have complete control due to producers or the MPAA interfering, but a lot of the minor differences here were creative choices by the man who created both. The story starts with a sleazeball of a man named Frank acquiring a puzzle box that he has been searching for. Once opened, he is torn apart in every conceivable way by the creatures not of our dimension. Sometime later, a man and his wife move into the house that Frank was ripped apart in. It was Frank and his brother's grandmother's house, and the man, Larry, says that Frank hasn't been around for ages. Julia, his wife, finds photos of Frank that remind her of when they made love right before their wedding. In fact, they had aggressive sex on top of her wedding dress. A girl, Kirsty, here Larry's daughter, comes by to help them move in, and Julia clearly doesn't like her. Larry has an accident and comes upstairs to the room Frank was dissolved in, and his blood causes a reincarnation of Frank, but not completely. He starts as a shadow of what he once was, an organic memory fused together with blood, desperation, and passion. A housewarming party ensues with Larry holding court and Julia miserable with the company, her husband included. Julia goes off to bed and stumbles across the remains of Frank, who tells her he needs more blood to become whole again. Julia hatches a plan for her true love and goes to a bar to lure a man back. Once back at the house, she seduces the man into the upstairs room where Frank waits. She kills the man in a gory way, and Frank takes over with the consumption to begin to make himself whole again, basically draining the man of all his sustenance. Larry comes home as everything is finishing up, and Julia must hustle to conceal the crime. Frank needs more time to complete his transformation, but he wants to leave as soon as possible before the Cenobites realize he's gone and come back for him. Julia repeats the steps and kills yet another man. Frank now has pain and other senses back. Frank makes too much noise upstairs and is almost caught before Julia takes charge of the situation and narrowly avoids detection. Larry asks Kirsty to speak with Julia, and when she arrives, she's confronted by a still skinless Frank. She fights him off, eventually with the box, and wakes up at the hospital before solving the box herself and inviting the Cenobites in. They plan to take her into their world of pleasure and suffering, but she offers up Frank, and since they can't go back alone, they agreed to trade for souls. Frank and Julia kill Larry, and Frank takes his skin now to complete the transformation. They intend to trick Kirsty, and they do at first until he says, Come to Daddy, just like Frank did. Come to Daddy. She scratches his face, and when he tries to kill her, he stabs Julia by mistake. A chase ensues where Kirsty finds one of the previous bodies, and the Cenobites arrive to claim their prize. They obliterate Frank, and Kirsty is able to escape them with the box. Very little was changed from page to screen, and what was has little bearing on the story as a whole. The box is called the Le Marchand configuration after the box's creator, and it would be known in later movies as the Lament configuration. Larry was originally named Rory in the novel, and while Kirsty does nearly everything the same in both mediums, Book Kirsty is an old friend of Rory who is in love with him. While this doesn't change how the story plays out, it gives the overall story a more incestuous tone. <laughs> the Cenobites are largely the same, but in the story they have no gender description. The lead Cenobite is not Pinhead in the story, but an engineer that we don't see in the movie. 
The larger, non-human-shaped creature that chases Kirsty in the hospital and eventually the house is non-existent in the book, and Pinhead seems to take the place of the engineer in the movie. They are also part of the Order of the Gash in the book, which probably made the MPA throw up in its mouth, and it's not mentioned in the film. Other smaller details are Julia using a hammer in the film, where her weapon of choice is a knife in the story. Kirsty in the film also has a love interest that is unnecessary in the book. The way Frank returns was changed too. I was going to say toned down, but we do get an incredible practical effect where he reforms in the movie. In the story, Frank first opens the box, and every sense he has goes crazy at the same time. To get some sort of clarity or conclusion, he relieves himself on the floor. The blood from the accident that Rory has mixes with the semen that Frank left, and that's how dimensions are opened. Finally, the ending changes slightly. In the movie, Kirsty finds Julia holding the box while running from the Cenobites, but in the story, they're not chasing her. Kirsty flees and runs into the engineer who is torturing Julia. The engineer gives Kirsty the box as the new warden, and she thinks she sees Frank and Julia inside of it. She then hopes that Rory is in another box that has a better ending where she can find him one day. Both of these properties have great legacies to their names. Hellbound Heart is a wonderful introduction to the works of Clive Barker, and eventually it would get two literary sequels. Hellraiser would be his directorial debut and give us, for better and for worse, a ton of Hellraiser movies. With that movie's success, we also got many more adaptations and a couple more Barker-directed films that, in my opinion, have only gotten better with age. These are both rich in their value and hold up wonderfully nearly 40 years on. Let us know in the comments which one you prefer, and as always... What's your pleasure, sir?